uh, Ulster was the most Gaelic, the most Irish of, of all the provinces, um, because it had never become uh, 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 Normanized. The only ones that ever got into <coughs> Northern Ireland was the de Courcys, and the O'Neills actually chased them out of there. By and large, they never really made any any uh, uh, implant there, impression there. I just wanted to sort of lay that out as a sort of a, a, a fundamental thing. Now, what's interesting is that that didn't bother Elizabeth so much. She was a practical stateswoman, and she actually. Um, reaffirmed or uh, she re-acknowledged Shane's right as the O'Neill. She didn't have any problem with him being inaugurated at Tullahog. Uh, Tullahog. Um, uh, her father Henry did and certainly his lieutenants did. That drove them crazy and especially the, the church, it drove them totally nuts. You know, the idea of a, an ancient chieftain going up on top of a hill, uh, sitting on a stone, and being inaugurated uh, by turning around and looking, you know, do all these little, I mean, that was totally unacceptable to the Archbishop in Armagh, or to the, the, the Orthodox thinkers uh, in Europe. So that was one of the things that the, the English, particularly Henry, made Khan Baca, Shane's father, renounce when he, when he made him Earl of Tyrone. Now, by, So by making him Earl of Tyrone rather than the O'Neill, a lot of other things were going on. Not just, we want your land, we want you to come under English law, uh, we want you to surrender and regrant was what was going on. And to me, those things are very powerful and very important. Now, none more than to the ordinary people in Ireland. Uh, they're the ones who understand that more than anybody in the world. They understood precisely why. And it, that's where I'm going to talk about really two O'Neills tonight, Shane O'Neill and Hugh O'Neill. And hopefully I'm going to persuade Monsignor O'Neill that Shane was the better of the two. And I will concede that both of them were great men in any, by any standards, they were great men. Um, although I'm going to probably up upset you by telling you that Hugh O'Neill wasn't even an O'Neill at all. Did you know that? I think you may have done. He was, actually was not an O'Neill. Now, that wasn't uh, uh, unusual in Ireland because uh, legitimacy and illegitimacy didn't have any <coughs> um, legitimacy. The, the concept didn't exist. In ancient, uh, in ancient Ireland, um, and what all that mattered was that you were an, an acknowledged son of your father. If he acknowledged you, that's that's all that matters. Um, and in those days, uh, <clears throat> to be a chieftain meant that you had pretty well free access to whatever women there were. I mean, it was an honor for, 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 uh, for um, a daughter or even a wife to, uh, <clears throat> to sleep with the chief when he came by. Same with the, with the birds. Yeah, amazing, but that's true. And that's why Shane, you know, the, the surname McShane is the son of Shane. So Shane left a lot of Shanes around. <laughs> and, uh, and so did... Um, so did uh, various O'Neills. But I mention that for this reason, because what happened actually was Con O'Neill, uh, Shane's father, was the O'Neill. Uh, this was Con Baca. He had succeeded from his father, who I think was, uh, what was Con Baca's father's name? Uh, son of Con Moore, Con Moore, king of Tyrone, um, grandfriend of Henry O'Neill. Um, but again, as I said, it, it doesn't matter. I, I'm uh, concentrating on Khan because he was the father of Shane. But to understand the O'Neills and understand what happened at that time, you need to understand both of the O'Neills because they're very different. 
Um, now, Con O'Neill, uh, he lived from 1480 to 1559. And I'm sure most of you will recognize when Queen Elizabeth came to the throne in 1558. There's two kind of dates that you kind of remember. 1588 was the, the Spanish Armada. 1558 was when uh, Elizabeth came to the throne. Most kids will remember those things. So Khan Baca O'Neill um, lived only one year after uh, Elizabeth came to the throne. But he's associated with Henry VIII, always has been, because it was Henry VIII who uh, threatened him and threatened to come and take his land. As you all know, Henry VIII was a very threatening figure. So when the word was out that he was going to come and get you, you know, you paid attention. So uh, he had sent over various um, deputies. Ireland was run by a deputy king, if you like, a lord deputy. And he acted in, uh, uh, had the full authority of the, uh, the sovereign. And uh, the existing earls pretty well knew how to behave with them. They, they were no different than uh, the other great noble figures in uh, England who acknowledged Henry as their sovereign. So the Fitzgeralds um, didn't have a great deal of difficulty acknowledging them, except that he treated them real badly. and. He did it to provoke them, and he provoked a rebellion by young Silken Thomas, uh, who was contemporary of Khan, uh, and he destroyed the Fitzgerald family. But I won't go into that. That's another another night. But um, now, of course, as you know, the Pale was the area around Dublin, which was the area controlled by the by the English, uh, directly by Dublin Castle. Uh, were not controlled by Fitzgerald or the O'Neills or anybody else, directly under the administration of Dublin, the Dublin Castle, and the English administration uh, in Ireland. Um, further south, you had the Butlers in Kilkenny uh, and the O'Briens in uh, Limerick area, and they were the Ormonds and the Desmonds. Um, but the O'Neills were different. So therefore, the plan was, we've got to get O'Neill over here to become an earl. So, uh, to bring him into the, the English system. And Shane, or sorry, Khan thought it over for a long time and delayed as long as he could, but finally uh, he had to go. But before he, before he went, and I come back to uh, an event that happened, which was an extremely important event, a woman came to him um, to his great hall, you know, they, 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 they lived in Dungannon, of course, that was their, their headquarters. The O'Neills are associated with Dungannon. Dungannon, you know, the fort of um, Shane actually set up his headquarters at Ben Burb, not too far away. But, um, so she came to, to, um, to Dungannon. And the way it was told by Manus O'Donnell, who was visiting from Donegal, the Donegals were nominally um, subservient to the O'Neills, just like the McGuinnesses were. <laughs> the McGuinness. And various others, the O'Reillys, the O'Dohertys, the O'Cahans, and so on. Uh, traditionally, uh, the O'Neills were the high kings of all of Ulster. Everybody is. But the, the O'Donnells were always a bit of a problem. They, they, they were the ones that always sort of... Uh, so it was, it was um, interesting that Manus O'Donnell and Khan O'Neill got on well together. Uh, even though they had fought each other, they were pretty well reconciled. Anyway, Manus O'Donnell tells the story about how this woman came to him, and he smelled a rat. He thought, this, this, this is not right. And this woman comes in, and uh, I don't know what her first name, but she was a widow from Dundalk. She'd been, she was married to, or had been married, to a blacksmith named Kelly. And she had this onsha of a son with her, I don't know if you know what an onsha is, right? <laughs> it's, well, actually, an onsha is a female. Sorry, he was an Amadon son. That's what he was. Onsha is a, is a female Amadon. But he had this sort of, like, I imagine him as kind of, like, not too bright. Uh, you know, maybe a little bit of a louse. He was considered. But, 